black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. And I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me, and this look of I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was he was he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Show everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to be talking to Winston, and Winston comes to us from Texas. And he had an encounter when he was out hunting. I believe it was back in 2010. And he stumbled up on one of these creatures looking in his deer blind. And he thought it was a guy in a ghillie suit at first. And the creature turned and for a short period of time they stood and looked at each other. A very scary account. And we're also going to be speaking to Pat. And Pat is a veteran of the military up there in Canada. And uh, Pat had a very... Fascinating account over there in the Middle East. You know, I talk to a lot of veterans on and off the air, and I've had several people tell me about these weird black dogs they run into, and every veteran I've ever talked to, I said, do you think it was a real dog? And I will tell you, 99% of the time, they'll say no. Jet black dog, very large, seems to show up out of nowhere, and seems to leave as quickly as it shows up. Uh, And Pat will also be sharing some Sasquatch encounters with us up there in Ontario, including one when he was on a military base. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Winston to the show. Winston, thanks for coming on. No, no, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you being here, and I know you had quite the encounter down there in Texas. Uh, if you would, just kind of start from the beginning. Kind of tell us what you were doing and and what happened. Uh, the second no, the second Saturday of November, uh, at about in between 3 and 3.30, I was going for a late hunt and was going to sit there until, until dark in my deer blind that was set up out in a in the woods in a on some land that we hunted on and i headed out to go hunting after i loaded up my gun and get to the deer blind and i always took the i always walked through the woods instead of taking a deer trail that you could follow and it led it led to where you could just step off of that and go right into the deer blind in the back but i I didn't like taking that because if deer travel that, I didn't want them, want them to smell me. So I would always walk right through the woods straight ahead and go to a fence line and then turn left and follow that to the deer blind. And as soon as I hit the woods, I smelt a smell that I could only, I can only uh, describe it as uh, a wet dog that had never known a bath mixed with a dead animal mixed with a porta can that has never been cleaned and it's filled with piss and crap all the way to the top of the rim of the commode and it just it was foul and i was because i 
figured it might be a dead animal and it would screw up my hunt that day. I was looking for it as I was walking through the woods and I could, I mean, I would stop and be, Jesus, what is that smell looking around? And I could never find it. I just kept going and kept going and I got to the, to the fence line and then took the left and started following the fence line. And I was probably, I want to say 50 or 60 yards from the, from where you step into the woods to get in because the deer blind was, I mean, between the fence and the woods, there was like a five or six foot spread of just a, a clear patch. And just you, you would have to step maybe three steps into the woods and to get to the deer blind. And, uh, I, I was probably 50 or 60 yards from it, and it looked like somebody was bent over and looking through the window, had their head in, in my deer blind of the, the window of the deer blind. And in my head, I thought, oh, my dad's here. I didn't see his car. And I walked about 10 more yards, and I said, no, that's a, that's, that's a big guy. That's, that's got to be some uh, another hunter. So I popped my gun off a safe. And I took maybe 10 more yards, 15 more yards, and got closer and said, no, that's somebody in a ghillie suit in my head I'm saying this. And I get a little bit closer, and I said, no, that's some dummy in a Bigfoot suit, and that's a good way to get shot by somebody like me. And about that time, I, I was probably between 25 to 35 yards from it, and it either heard me or smelt me and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up and that that shocked me and froze me right where i stood and i was trying in my head to figure out whether it was a guy in a in a bigfoot suit or a real bigfoot and i mean before two years before Andre the Giant died, I ran into him in Abilene, Texas, coming out of the kettle. So I've met Andre the Giant before, and he was seven foot six. He was a big guy, and whatever this was made him look like a little guy. So they don't make people that that big, and I could see the muscles underneath its fur flexing, and working i could see you know any any time it breathed i could see underneath its fur moving so i knew dead gum well it wasn't somebody in a suit that was some something real that was a real creature and we probably s stared at each other for what seemed like forever to me but it was probably about 10, 15 seconds, and I didn't move. I was frozen. So it stomped the ground and did a grunt growl like, Ugh. and when it did that, I bet you I jumped about a foot in the air, And but I stayed frozen in, in fright and fear. And when it did that, from the distance it was away, the only way I can describe this is like a lion. When it roars, you can feel it reverberate in your body, in your in your chest, and that's what it did. And it kept me frozen in fright, and I didn't move, so it just turned around and walked away from me, and literally stepped over a barbed wire fence just pushed it down a little bit with its hand and looked back over its shoulder at me kind of like the patty did in the patterson gimlin footage and then it walked across a field and halfway across a field it looked back again at me and when it got to the other side there was another barbed wire fence but there was trees going across that one and it stepped over that barbed wire fence between a couple of trees that was maybe five or six inches in diameter. And when it reached, it reached up to use that as a, as a brace, kind of like a human would, but instead of grabbing it like a human would with its thumb upwards, it didn't wrap its thumb around the tree like a monkey. It reached up 
and had the thumb pointing down and with all of its fingers, thumb and all, it grabbed the tree, looked back at me and stepped into the woods and it was like it disappeared, like it was magic. It just vanished and I didn't smell it no more, nothing. Yeah, that's terrifying, man. That's terrifying to be that close with something so big. And what what did you think, uh, before we talk about, you know, descriptions and everything, what did you think about the whole topic of Sasquatch part of this? Uh, I was I was on the fence about it. I, as a kid, I seen the Patterson Gimlin Gimlin footage, and that was pretty compelling to me because when you watch that, I mean, you can see the shoulder blades moving and the muscles and stuff. So in my head, they existed, but I had never seen one before that day. And that was the uh, turning point. I am no longer a believer. I am a knower of, of Bigfoot. Yeah, I hear you. Well, if you if you would, for the audience listening, can you kind of describe when he turned and looked at you, can you kind of describe for the audience what what you saw? Oh, yeah. We stood and, and looked at each other without any, any woods or anything in between us for at least 15 seconds i can tell you exactly what he looks like the their face i want to say the the harry and the henderson's bigfoot is close but it's not exact their their face isn't as monkey looking as harry's face they they look more neanderthal uh it, it had a beard like a man it 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 had a mustache, but it what it didn't have was a round head. It had a cone-shaped head like a gorilla's, and its shoulder muscles that connect to your to the bottom of our neck doesn't connect to the bottom of their neck. It connects to the back of their skulls like a gorilla, so it makes it look like it don't have a neck. And this thing was jacked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, you could see the muscles underneath and the body the sheer body mass of this thing i mean i'm i'm a f five eight five nine guy and i weigh about 155 to 165 pounds and i mean this thing's legs were as big as my torso or bigger i mean this thing was huge it was i i work commercial construction too so it was at least between nine and 12 feet tall somewhere in there. I mean, it was a big guy. And yes, it was a guy. I could see its genitals through the fur. Uh, when it walked away, I could see its muscles moving. I could, I could literally see when it stepped and, and walked, I could see the mid tarsal break in its foot halfway up its foot. It like, like, a, like your toes bend when you step its foot in the middle of its foot bends. Did did the uh, expression on the face change? Obviously, when it grunted, but um, as you were looking, oh yeah, it, you could tell that it was startled at first when it when it looked at me, but it tried to present itself as it wasn't afraid, and it it scowled at me a little bit, and I didn't move, so it stomped the ground and grunt and growled at me and when it did i mean it it had an evil look on its face when it did i almost i almost bolted but i i figured like an animal it might it might make it chase you you know so i i didn't i just stayed frozen it's its color was a reddish brown like an orangutan on its back and on its shoulders it was a little bit darker like a blackish color it's it's arms it's arms long and and they go to like their knees man their their arms are long yeah one question i want to ask you and i don't mean to gross the audience out but as far as its sexual member um you know a lot of times when you look at like uh gorillas they're built they're tiny uh, especially in the men you think they'd be a lot bigger on a on like a gorilla or something like that but they're not and I was just curious, would you say it's equal to like, I know this sounds like a weird question, so forgive me. Uh, would you say it's like equal to like a, a man or would you say it was smaller or would you say it was bigger? I would, there's a lot of hair down there. So I would say it was at least in between the size of a human's and, and a gorilla's to the, the, a, 
the same uh, like ours would be. I mean, it's it's right around in between, either in between or the same size. There was a lot of hair, so you can't really tell, but it sure as heck wasn't gorilla size. <laughs> yeah, gorillas are, are tiny genitals because the females are way smaller. Yeah, and, and I was just, I don't mean to go off on that. It's just curious when people actually see the genitals. I'm curious on what people are seeing. I don't know why. Uh, maybe because when I see like a gorilla, anyway, I'll change the topic. Um, it's all right. <laughs> um, it, it makes you wonder, but do you think it, it was your deer uh, blind set up for a long period of time or had you just put it up? Oh, no, it had been set up for since uh since september we always set our deer blinds up prior to the hunt so the animals get used to them and actually two days prior i was in the blind and in a, around 10 o'clock in the morning a buck was chasing a doe it was they were coming towards a, the fence line that i walked down there was a spot in the field where where the deer we could we set it up there because you could get a shot at deer coming over the deer blind and i thought to myself you know when this buck jumps over this fence i'm gonna plug him and the doe jumped over the fence and as soon as it did as soon as it hit this side of the fence it immediately jumped to the right over that fence that the sasquatch through the trees jumped through and the buck come over chasing her but as soon as his front hooves touched the ground i mean he immediately jumped back over the fence line and took off and i unzipped the tent and got out to get a shot because i seen him stop and i pulled up my gun to get a shot but when i did i was looking at him and he wasn't looking at me it was he it was looking past me so i literally just put my gun down and turned around and was trying to figure out what the hell spooked it but i could never see it and to this day, I think that Sasquatch was there watching, but I never could see him. Yeah, the behavior is really fascinating to me. It's it's almost like this thing was curious to see if you were in that little deer blind or not, yeah. and he wasn't paying attention to his yeah. surroundings. Yeah, a couple of days after that, when I walked up on it, I think that it was checking to see if I was in there, and I wasn't in there, so it stuck its head. I'm I'm just speculating this, but... You know, being being curious, I think it, once it realized that I wasn't in there, it stuck his head in there and was looking to see what was in there. Because we left candy bars and stuff in there, you know. The creature, too, you know, it's it didn't attack. How It was almost like a warning, like uh, you see guys in bars that want to pick a fight. They always puff their chest out, and they usually tend to run their mouths, but they're the last guys to do anything. And the Sasquatch kind of, I know it's a bad comparison, the Sasquatch kind of reminds me of that because it kind of did like a jerky motion towards you, stomped and growled, and you didn't leave, so it decided to leave. Thank God. Yeah, yeah, I think he was bluffing me, but then again, I'm, and and I had a gun with me is what, what drives me crazy. Now, if I could turn back time, I would have tried to shoot it. But at that time, I was, I was trying to go through my head, trying to figure out whether it was a, a person because it looked so human-like in the face or whether it was a creature. But, I mean, now I, I know, and it's not like I want to go out and kill the species, but in, in, we have... Since that time, I have really gotten into watching Sasquatch documentaries and stuff. And, I mean, it, it's like we have DNA evidence that they won't recognize because it's so human-like. We have hair that they won't recognize. We have footprints that they won't acknowledge. We have hair samples that they won't acknowledge. And to me, what we need, the, the only way you're going to get them to to believe anything is if you bring one down to validate the species. Yeah, I tend to agree with you on that, if you can get it in, but I, I tend to agree with you. I, I think that one should be shot, and I think that uh, in a safe way, and I mean safe for you, not for it, 
Um, and I think with, you know, like Grover Krantz, the late Grover Krantz, he, his whole take was one should be shot and brought in. And people used to argue with him all the time. Well, what if, you know, it's an endangered species? And he said, if we kill one and bring it in uh, and that destroys the species, well, they're already in trouble, you know, and so there's no sense in... And these things have been shot. I've talked to hunters who've shot them, uh, but you have to be oh, yeah. careful with that because even though uh, I tend to think that they travel in groups, not necessarily, maybe not together side by side, but if you see one, there's probably two or three others nearby. Uh, yeah, you know. yeah. I've uh, I've watched some documentaries, and it, it seems to be that they have family groups that they travel in, and. And uh, I'm I'm kind of glad that I didn't raise my gun because, you know, I was looking at this thing, but who's to say there wasn't one right there in the woods watching me? Yeah, and I think that's what you have to – there seems to be a revenge streak in these things, and you hear a lot of accounts like yeah. that. Uh, what part of Texas did this happen? And you don't have to give a, the exact location. Was it East Texas or was it uh, – It was close to – it was right around – Outside of Austin, it was uh, in central Texas. I lived in uh, a county called Bastrop County, and we hunted on some land way outside in in a in a region called Muldoon. And I I, can, I actually can can describe how to get there. You you go down a uh, the highway that. If you're leaving Smithville, where the where the new high school was built, and you're going, I guess, towards San Antonio region south, uh, you hit this road called Zappalack Road, and you turn on that, and you drive down that until until it turns dirt road, and then there was another dirt road called uh jones road and we would turn left on that and go all the way down until that road ends and on the right there was land i mean you're so far out that it, it and it's rural that that i mean you're literally in the woods <laughs> did you ever go back hunting after this incident do you ever go back to that area no i didn't not only not go back to that area i stopped hunting i i hunted since i was a kid like my dad took me hunting since i was five years old and that day that was the end of my hunting i have i haven't hunted since i gave the woods to the master of the woods <laughs> yeah it kind of turns your we, world upside down doesn't it yeah i didn't even go back and get the blind i mean that was it i just we left it my dad was pissed too, boy. He was like, you didn't go get that blind? No. <laughs> Why not? Because I never told him that I ran into it. But I was like, no, I, I'll, I'll get another one, you know. I, I never went back and got it. Yeah, I hear you. What, what do you think that they are? What's your opinion, Winston, as far as what these things are? Uh, that's, a, that's a tricky question. <laughs> because I... I actually am coming to a conclusion that that uh, they are what what we haven't. They are an unevolved branch of what we are. Is I I think that we come from at least a cousin of what they are. I think they are a naturally evolving upright primate. And if we evolve from an upright primate, I think that the ones that we evolve from are of a smaller sect of them. And because they look so human, it's it's ungodly in the face. Yeah, and there's no wrong answer to that question. I mean, um, and no one really knows. Uh, I'm always just kind of curious on what, what people think. So you think it leans more towards uh, human on the family tree? Is that kind of what you're saying? Oh, yeah. I, I guarantee you it's a cousin, at least. <laughs> yeah, you could be right. You could be right about your your theory. And like I said, there's no wrong answer. Um, a lot of people, you know, they will say, like up here in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of people will say uh, it looked more gorilla-like. It had the human nose. It had, uh, there was parts of it that were not human, that were more animal-like. 
And then you do get the reports of people who say it looked more like a chimpanzee in the face. It had the human nose, it had big black eyes. And then sometimes you, uh, you do run into a lot of people that say it looked human. I've heard exactly what you said. Had it, it looked like a man, man's face, but on an animal's body is what a lot of people say. It's, it's, it really, it's, it's got a, a big brow, so like a Neanderthal's. And its nose is more human-like than, than, than primate, but it's wider and, and it's got bigger nostrils. But I mean, it, it could have been because there was a lot of the the beard and the mustache of it to where I couldn't see the primate looking, you know, bottom part of its face. But to me, it just looked more more Neanderthal in the face. But its body structure, its body structure looks primate. I mean, its its arms are longer than a human's. It's 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 just it's built more primate. It's its shoulder muscles connect to the back of its skull. It's got the cone head. I mean, it's we're primate. We're on the primate tree. I don't see it when when I look at a human. I don't. I don't. I think we are a perversion of some sort because you can line all the primates in the world up and they all look like they belong together. And if you were to put a Sasquatch in that mix it looks like it belongs on the primate family tree when you put a human in that mix we don't jive <laughs> yeah you're right you're right I, I can't disagree with that one question i want to ask you did it show its teeth you... uh i mean i was 35 yards away but yeah when it grunt growled at me it kind of snarled it's squinted its nose up yeah i guess i could see its teeth a little bit i can't tell i mean it i can't no i, I can't definitively you. say what they because it was 35 40 yards well 25 or 35 yards away but yeah I, it had teeth <laughs> yeah and it just shows the intelligence of these things you know to um like like you said earlier kind of bluff you you know and and uh, sometimes I wonder if they do that to see what you're going to do. And I think if you make the wrong mistake, you're going to pay for it. I think the fact that, and luckily us as humans, when we become terrified, people freeze. When you have real fear, people freeze. And I think it yeah. throws these things off because they're like, okay, he's not really running. He's not really doing anything. I'm just going to leave. But it shows that it was still keeping an eye on you as it walked off. I would kind of step back and look in your direction to make sure you weren't following it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it terrified me. I've never been scared in my life like that. That was a once in a lifetime ordeal. I mean, it put my heart in my throat. It scared the crap right at me <laughs> to the yeah. point where I don't hunt. no. Yeah. And I hate to hear that. It's kind of a shame. I'm, I'm with you on that though, because, um, you know, these things are out there and it makes you, makes you a little concerned. Maybe the next one won't bluff you. It'll actually come for you. Yeah. Especially in Texas, they seem to be a little bit more aggressive than, than the tree hugging Oregon Sasquatch. <laughs> yeah. I'm not so sure the Oregon ones are tree hugging, you know, loving your forest brothers either, but I tend to agree with you. I think in Texas, they seem to be more pissed. And I would be more pissed, too, if I had to live out in those woods, man. It's brutal out there in the summertime, and everything Hot. wants to kill you. In Texas, I think that they're just, they've been, they've been uh, pushed out of their habitat so much because the population of humans are growing that, that they're having to rely on living in swamps and, and way away from, way out in the middle of nowhere. And I think they end up, interbreeding that's why you see some in texas that have three toes and messed up feet and stuff but that's just a speculation from the uh observations of the documentaries that i've seen since my encounter yeah i hear you well i appreciate it winston i mean it, it was quite the encounter and you know when you're toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of these things it, it's an eye-opener it'll turn your world upside down but uh i really appreciate you coming on and and sharing what happened to you. Oh yeah. For the, for the first, uh, I want to say for the first year and a half to two years, 
I wouldn't tell anybody about it. But now, I mean, I've gotten to the point where, you know, I'm not, I'm not afraid to, to, uh, to tell the truth about what I saw. I mean, that's, I, I know what I saw. I've, I've been hunting since I was a little kid and I'm not going to lie about it. If somebody wants to know, I'm going to tell them whether they call me a liar or not, man. Well, you think I'm a liar. You go out in the woods and, and it, a lot of people tell me, you know, they don't exist with the, I've never seen one. And I'm like, yeah, do you hunt? Well, yeah, I hunt. Really? Well, let me ask you this. How often do you see a bobcat or a mountain lion? Well, I've never seen one. That's right, because they're elusive. <laughs> the show, Pat, thanks for coming on. Oh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, the honor is mine. Um, and I know you're a veteran, and I know you've actually had a few Sasquatch encounters out there in Ontario. One of the things I wanted to start with was uh, in Afghanistan and these black dogs. Because I've actually, I do have a military audience that does listen and I've had a lot of military guys tell me strange stories about these black dogs. So if you would, tell us about what, what happened in Afghanistan. Oh, gee. Um, well, I was out in um, uh, Ford Operating Base, a FOB, uh, up north of uh, Kandahar City, uh, probably about an hour or an hour and a half. I f- forget which province it was in at this, at this time. It was like right in the cusp of the border between different uh districts in different provinces but uh, we're out there i was with the uh i was working with the refueling section with uh that were detached to uh help uh, the engineers rebuild this uh forward operating base and uh so our our refueler had been like dug into the earthworks like basically dug a big hole and then it's backed in type thing and then just off to the rear to the right like the driver's side of the vehicle we had our own little makeshift shelter, you know, three uh, mounds of dirt around us with a impromptu uh, canvas over top of us. And we had uh, two cots in there. And the, and the space is a small area. It's about maybe 10 feet square, uh, the shelter. And uh, so I remember one night we were out there and uh, I was lying there and my rifle was laying beside me on the, on the, on the ground, on, uh, on the ground sheet. And, uh, my pistol was, I would have it tucked up beneath my, my pillow. In the middle of the night, I wake up to something making noise at, you know, at, at just outside the entrance of our, uh, shelter. So I look, I look down at my feet and there's this huge freaking dog right at the foot of my uh cot like it's like within like a foot of my feet and this thing sat stood about or oh, i'd say three three and a half feet at the shoulder and it was uh actually going through uh our garbage bag that we had uh we hadn't had time to bring out to uh for disposal from that day and so i, I looked down at it and I just got this feeling of, oh shit, this is not good. Cause I'd never seen anything like that. Like I've seen other dogs in Afghanistan, but they're like, just, they're nothing compared to the size of this thing. And it was jet black. Like the desert gets dark at night, but this thing was darker than dark. Like I, I can't really explain it. Almost like. Um, I, I've heard stories of how uh, some people have uh, Sasquatch encounters where they they say the darkness of it kind of absorbs the light. Yeah. I guess that's that's basically the best way I could describe it. And so I was I slowly reached up to grab my pistol because if I would have rolled over to grab my rifle, I knew like I wouldn't have time to grab it. So I. Just, you know, slowly reached up, raised my pillow, grabbed my pistol, and I slowly brought it down, and I'm still rummaging through, and then I'm looking down the uh, the sights of my pistol at this thing and going, you know what, this pistol's not going to do anything to that thing. And uh, we're our service pistols up here in Canada uh, are 9 uh, millimeter, 
So I'm thinking, no, this thing is not doing anything to this animal. And then I guess it noticed my movement or whatever. And I just, this, this growl, like, um, how can I best describe it? Um, like deep in his chest, like, uh, like I've heard dogs growl, but this is very, very deep. And then I saw the, the flash of white teeth and I'm like, how the hell is this possible? Like this thing is so black, it's pitch black outside. How the hell am I seeing its teeth? Like, and like they weren't small teeth at all either. And so, yeah, so I just kind of like put my pistol down. I'm like, you know what? I, I'm done. <laughs> like if this thing wants me, it's, it's got me. Um, there's nothing I can do. And my, uh, a fire team partner uh, in the States, you guys call it uh, battle buddies. Uh, they're laying on the cot beside me about four feet to my side. And they were fast asleep. They didn't even know what the hell was going on. I'm thinking, oh man, like we're done. And we're in the middle of the, the working area. And we have all around a fence on this fob. And we also had like observation posts set up around the area on high ground so i don't know how the hell this thing got in uh into our into the fob it was oh it was crazy so what did you do next i just i just laid there and i looked at it and then i closed my eyes and i uh, i was just praying i was reaching out to god i'm going you know what big guy um let us stick around a bit longer, would you? Because this thing is like, wow. I thought for sure we were goners. And I just closed my eyes and just prayed and prayed and prayed. And then I'd say 10, 15 minutes later, I didn't even hear this thing leave. I opened up my eyes and the thing was gone. Can I ask you, what, what do you think it was? Do you think it was actually a real dog or do you think it was... I mean, what's your opinion on as far as what it was? I, it had the appearance of a dog, like a very large dog. Like I said, it, it sat, it stood three, three and a half feet at the shoulder, and you know, it had long, dark fur, um, and definitely canine teeth. I didn't. There was no eye shine or eye glow because there was no ambient light where we were. It was some type of creature i don't know like it looked like it was uh quadruped so i didn't even hear this thing leave yeah i don't know what that is you know like i said i've talked to many soldiers who've seen this thing and it's very close to your description i mean they describe it as bigger than your average dog and jet black that's one that's the two things i hear a lot it, and i remember one guy he was in a tank you and i were just talking about this before we went on the air uh, he was in a tank, and this was in Iraq. Um, and they were out in the middle of the desert. It's the middle of the night. And um, I think that they saw them. I don't remember how they saw them. I think it was a, with the night vision. Um, and these three dogs showed up. And that's the other thing I, I've heard a lot, where they show up in groups of three or sometimes just one. Uh, but they're jet black. They're big. And they kind of surrounded the tank. And, you know, one of the the infantryman told me, he goes, you know, we run into uh, dogs out here all the time. I mean, they run around and it's just a different culture regarding dogs. Uh, but he goes, this thing, I don't know what this thing was. Um, so it makes me wonder. And then I've heard other soldiers tell me that it's a gin. I don't know if they have that. They probably have that in Afghanistan. Um, yeah. I've, I've heard of that in Afghanistan, the gin. Yeah. They're talking with the locals through the, uh, the interpreters. Yeah, and I've heard that they're the gin. These dogs are the gin, um, but they're weird, and they they grab guys' attention because a I think of the size, and then b everyone I talk to, and it, there's been guys I've seen them in the middle of the day, and say they're jet black, they're really fast, they tend to just show up and tend to just disappear. It makes you wonder what that thing is. Oh yeah, definitely. Because I know like as soon as I realized it was gone, right away I like. You know, in a loud whisper, I got my uh, my fire team partner up, and I said, "You know, 
cover me. I got to check something out. So he grabbed his rifle and I grabbed mine. And when I pulled out my, uh, my red light, cause we don't use uh, any white light in, uh, in theater and I could see no tracks. The dirt was very, you know, you could see tracks. If there was, if you would walk, you would see your tracks. Like it wasn't like it was hard pack, uh, dirt. It was very soft and malleable, but our garbage was completely strewn all over the, uh, the, about three, four feet around the garbage bag. And that was, that was the only evidence that it was there. Yeah. So strange. Did you tell, did you talk to anyone else about this besides your battle, battle buddy or what, whatever you guys call it, your partner? Uh, did you tell anyone about this encounter? Oh, hell no. Who the hell is going to believe you? <laughs> like it's, it was the first time I seen it and I hadn't heard anybody else from the battle group who had seen it. And I had, you know, I had friends all over the battle group and nobody said anything to me. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, it is fascinating. I, I'd love to know what it is because, like I said, I've talked to two dozen veterans that um, have seen it. And every time I ask them, do you think it was a real dog? You just, just a big dog you ran into. Um, I, I haven't had one person tell me that they thought it was a real dog. They always, they won't, generally, they won't say what they think it is, but they'll say, I, I think it was more of an entity or uh, I don't think it was a dog. Um, and it's weird. It takes that form over there as a dog. Cause you know, I don't think that we, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say something like that. I mean, we have dog men and that sort of thing, you know, I'll get reports of that, but this sounds like a hybrid dog spirit entity that just seems to show up. Oh, this thing was on all fours. Like it did not, it did not walk bipedally. It was on all fours. Like, like I said, at the, at the shoulder, it was three, three and a half feet tall. And then, you know, probably tapered off maybe four or five inches towards the rear haunch. Can I ask you, was there any anything else you saw over in Afghanistan that was just odd? I know it's kind of a weird question, but um, was there anything else that you saw over there that stood out to you? Mm, not really. Not that comes to mind. I probably, you know, after I got the phone with you, uh, I'll probably think of something. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, uh, off the top of my my mind, that's the only thing that really stood out for me. Um, like I was, I was completely flabbergasted by this thing. Like it was, wow, just crazy. Yeah, I hear you. I would have been too. I would have been too. It's strange that it left physical evidence, um, and I've heard that too. Not so much tracks, but you know, getting into garbage or doing what you would think a dog would do. But again, everyone I've talked to doesn't think it's a physical dog. Well, that's the thing, right? Like I'm thinking, okay, well, it went through the garbage. Why are there no damn tracks? There was nothing. Just our boot prints from the night before. It's so strange. Well, tell me about your, I know we're going to talk about three encounters. Did all of them happen in Ontario? Uh, one happened on a training base uh, here in Ontario. The other two were on the uh, Quebec side. Okay. Um, well, let's kind of go in chronological order. I know one of them happened when you were very young. Um, kind of tell us what you were doing and, and what happened. Oh, so as I was growing up out in the country, uh, I must have been about 12, maybe 13 at the time. I'm 43 now. So uh, I used to go uh, during the summer. Uh, I used to go pick uh, dew worms up in the farmer's fields up on the other side of the the um, Canadian Shield. Like that's, you know, worn down mountains in the uh, eastern part of Canada. Uh, so I was going up and over this one, you know, quote unquote mountain to go to the farmer's field on the other side, you know, because I'd pick the dew worms and I'd sell them on the side of the road for people coming in and out, you know, going fishing and whatnot. So I was on my way up and I heard, like, I noticed everything was like just really quiet. And then uh, I heard like this really, really weird sound. Like it was like, a, I don't know if you've had anybody relate this sound to you. It was like, a, uh, how can I, how does it go? It's like a, like a pew, pew, that 
kind of like that kind of sound, but more more elongated, like a pew type thing. It sounded really weird, and I was like, "What the hell is that?" So then I got this sense of like I had to hide, like I had to like find cover, and so there just happened to be a down log right there, and crashed down behind it, and then within. 10, 15 minutes, the feeling completely subsided. And I just turned around and went back home. So I have, I, I know that there's been uh, reports of uh, UFOs up in that area. Um, I've been told Sasquatch are up in that area. Um, so I don't know what it could have been. Yeah, it's strange. I know um, sometimes with uh, a lot of Sasquatch encounters, you'll hear uh, people say, you know, what I what I heard was kind of mechanical. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, mechanical. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, you'll hear that a lot. I've heard that here mainly in the States a lot where eyewitnesses will say, yeah, it didn't sound, you know, it sounded mechanical. It didn't sound like an animal. And the longer they stick around, the more it turns into... Uh, like a roar or a scream or something like that. But a lot of people say mechanical. That That's fascinating. How old were you when that happened? That, I was about 12 or 13. And you know what? Mechanical sounds like the best description because it was almost like a, almost like a computerized mechanical type sound. Like, I don't know. Like, it, And at the time, I'm 12 years old, so that's like 30 years ago. So, you know... You didn't really have anything except for your, uh, you know, Sony Discman, or not even a Sony Discman. You had your little Walkman or your little Ghetto Blaster, but, you know, nothing out in the bush is going to make that noise. And um, and that bush is, it's mixed forest, but it's mainly um, uh, coniferous. So a lot of pines, a lot of cedar. It's strange that you get, the fe- you get that fear of you, you had to hide. You know, that's kind of a... A telling sign right there as opposed to just hearing some weird mechanical noise and going about your business um how many years later did your second encounter happen uh my second encounter happened in 98 uh when i was doing some uh training with the uh canadian army uh at a base here in ontario it was weird because i was out, out on a reconnaissance patrol with uh three other guys and we went and did our reconnaissance part and uh, we're on the way back to, uh, to the vehicle to get, uh, you know, extracted out of the area. And on the way I was the rear guy in the patrol and I could hear something following us, you know, and yeah, there's bear, there's fox, you know, there, you name the kind of animals they have them out there. And this is death of night. So I'm like, okay, visibility is like next to nothing. So then I tapped the guy on the shoulder in front of me and I said, pass up, we're being followed. And then so we stopped and the section commander was like, what do you mean we're being followed? I'm like, we're being followed. And he's like, okay. He goes, keep an ear and uh, let me know if you hear anything else. And then next thing you know, it's kind of like flanking us it's on the side as for you know walking out of the bush and uh so he stops he's like you guys hear that and we're like yeah so he's like okay so this is what we're gonna do he goes get your magazines ready he goes we're gonna do uh what the canine army does for um breaking contact when you're a small forest um I'm not going to use the term because it, I don't know how, uh, if I want to say any kind of formations that we use over the radio. So it's it's a, it's a technique that we use in the Canadian Army to uh, break contact with uh, a larger force. And uh, he was, you know, this is what we're going to do. And where we're running is that way. He directed us. He goes, you guys, as we're running, you don't stop. You just keep going that way. Next thing you know, he's on the radio. We're doing our business, shooting and doing whatever we got to do. And he's on the radio saying, you better be there when we get there because we got to go now. 
and that's what he said over the radio. I don't know what the response was because I couldn't hear him. And uh, there's also that's what the first time I smelt uh, almost like a, a swamp, a musky odor. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. It wasn't like uh, nothing, nothing rotted or anything like that. It was like a just like a, a musty, swampy uh, odor. And uh, so, yeah, and that was my my second encounter. Let me ask you did you did you guys ever talk about it afterwards? Like, what what the hell was following us? Uh, we did ask. I said, "What the hell was that?" He goes, "Oh, it was just I was just a bear." But I'm thinking, okay, well, if it was a bear, it would have made more noise if it was following us because or flanking us. Because bears don't typically flank somebody, to, to the best of my knowledge. I could be mistaken. No, just you're right. Just in my experience. Yeah, it's uh, not a predator. A predator normally doesn't do that. A no, most known predators don't. don't. If they're going to come for you, they're going to come for you. You're in big trouble. You know, they're well, not exactly. going to sit and play games with you. Yeah. Well, however, cougars will flank you and will get in front of you to do stuff but that's a cougar right that's not a that's not a bear <laughs> yeah and you probably would have never heard a cougar they're, no, they're exactly. pretty quiet yeah and you hear you know what's fa- fascinating about that patrick um is you know out here in um like washington state we have fort lewis and you'll hear a lot of similar type encounters what you just told you'll hear a lot of guys talk about that on the base and it's a huge base i mean you could get you could get lost on that base. There's so much land. Um, but you'll hear a lot of guys repeat that encounter to where they're out there, three, four, five, ten guys, and they're being followed through the woods and they can't figure out what's following them. And, you know, it's not a hunter. A hunter's not going to be out there on the base following these oh, guys. Oh, no, definitely not, because that's all restricted area, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And, and, and the base I was on training, it's a, it's a pretty big base, too. Like, it's uh, it's you know, right along the uh, Ottawa River. So uh, it's, it's a pretty significant training area. And I love those type encounters, especially from military guys. And did you guys have live ammo or was it blanks? No, we were using blanks because we were in the training area. And uh, so we were just making as much noise as possible to get out of there. Yeah, that's so. got to be a, a little unnerving to have blanks um, <laughs> in a situation yeah, like that. it's kind of like... Oh shit! A bear's coming. Okay, quick fix. You know, fix bayonets. <laughs> yeah, fix bayonets, and let's go in. Uh, especially with the size of bears, you guys, you guys have uh, grizzlies up that way, don't you? Uh, no, uh, not in Ontario. We have them more out towards the uh, the west coast, up in the mountains. Oh, I got gotcha. uh, Alberta and uh, BC. So it's mainly black bear. Yeah, black brown bear. Yeah. Yeah, and for the most part, they're skittish. I mean, they, they generally don't want an altercation with you. That's been my experience with most black bears anyway. They, they're just gone. The minute they get oh, yeah. a whiff of you, they're gone. Exactly. As soon as they're like, what the hell is that? Unless you're like between the mother and his cubs, they're not coming anywhere near you. Yeah, and the other thing too, I don't think it was a cougar, but a cougar generally, uh, they're pretty smart. You know, a cougar will go after a small child, maybe a small woman, Several guys hiking through the woods. I don't see a cougar picking that fight. They're too smart for that. Well, exactly right, and like their their night sight is you know superior to ours to begin with. So they can see there's four grown men. You know, it's not going to really be a pick off all of us at once without getting hurt itself because yeah. no, no predator is going to put itself in a position there that they may get injured. Because that's certain death in the wild. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Well, tell me about your your last encounter. When when did this happen, Pat? So the last one was ninety eight, and when was this this next the, one? This last one was about uh, I'd say about three, maybe three years ago, give or take. Uh, I was camping uh, on an island I I usually go to. Um, it's deep water all around. You know, uh, there's a small island not too far off the uh, northern tip of it. If you're wearing water shoes, you could probably traverse it. But, you know, it's pretty rocky and whatnot. And 
weedy and whatnot. So I, I usually go camping out there, and I, I've been going camping there for OG over 20 years. And um, so I got a nice little niched out area there and landscaped it and terraformed it just the way I like it. And uh, I've gone there with, you know, my dog countless times, gone there with, you know, my brother's camping, friends camping. And then uh, a few years ago, uh, I had my two dogs. I have got two Belgian Malinois. And uh, the youngest one, uh, I was sitting by the fire, uh, just, you know, drinking my, my beer and having a smoke. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to get up and go grab another beer and as I stand up my youngest he gets up he just automatically his ears go right up you know right back on his head and just like very very deep growl and a snarl and then just a a very deep bark and for him to do that, it's unheard of. Um, he's not that uh, type of dog to, to do that. Um, so I'm like, what is it? What is it, Buster? And I'm like, what do you see, buddy? So I'm looking through, and on the other side, I keep a, a propane lantern uh, lit in my camping area, but it's just on low light just so I can see to go back and forth to the tent, to the fire uh, pit. And on the far side of my campsite, I see this really big, dark silhouette, but it's just at the edge of the light, just outside the light. And I'm like, what the hell is that? And so my machete was, you know, uh, stuck in a, in a log beside my, uh, my tent. So I picked that up like, so I grabbed that and, you know, that, again, I got that fear of like, you know, something's not right. Like this, this doesn't feel, felt very, very uneasy. And, you know, for, for me to, to sleep with a weapon in my tent on that island is unheard of. Like I never do it. But I tell you that night I slept with my machete right by my side, like, I had like that much, you know, fear, I guess you could say. Did your dog stop kind of growling after a while? Or do you think the thing was around whatever was outside your campsite? Do you think it was there for a while? Uh, yeah, I think it was. Um, I could hear, you know, the odd branch or twig snap um, up on up on the hill that, that – uh, is backing on my uh, campsite, and um, but every time there would be a, a crack, my youngest again he'd do that deep uh, guttural growl, and he'd always face exactly which direction you know that noise came from. And I was like, so I'm like, oh man, this is not good because <laughs> up here in Canada we don't have. Uh, we don't have uh, concealed carry or open carry, so we don't really go camping with uh, weapons at all up here, unless it's like a machete or a knife. Yeah, that's so, a little terrifying. To be yeah, especially when you see something that you know. And I say like this shadow was about oh easily seven seven and a half feet high. Was it the silhouette of like a man, or was it? I mean, what when you say silhouette, what? It was like a, a humanoid uh, silhouette, like uh, like a, yeah, I guess a man. You know, I I could see the outline of the shoulders, uh, but it was just really dark. And like I said, just outside the light, like I could just see enough, but I just couldn't see enough to get any real detail. I get you. I understand. And so I, I'm assuming the whatever this creature left. After a period of time? Yeah, it must have because, you know, because uh, back that way is that's where I have my uh, my chemical toilet set up. So it's a pretty cleared out area. So I could have like turned around and walked out and I wouldn't even heard it. Did you leave the next day? Were you like, let's go, Buster, let's get the hell out of here? 
Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would have too. I'm like, you know what, Captain Chris Horror's boys. <laughs> yeah. Copper, Copper, Buster, get in the canoe. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Have you been back to that area since this happened? Uh, I have, and uh, nothing. I nothing felt weird after that. It was just that one night. It was it was really weird, and that's the first time I felt like that on the island. Like I was being watched. Uh, that there was a pre- another presence there on the island. I hear you. Well, I, one question I want to ask you, what, and I ask everyone, what do you think Sasquatch is? What's your own personal opinion? Uh, See, so, you know, I thought I'd come up with like this really cool answer to that question because I listen to uh, to your podcast all the time. But you know, I really don't know. Uh, I, I think it's it is a creature. I'd say maybe a cross between like a primate and a human. Just because of the stature, the way, the, the way it stands up, um, e- even gorillas, primates, they don't, you know, walk around forever on two feet. They do walk on two feet, mind you, but not for, you know, a long period of time. I hear you. And so you think it's more of a, um, uh, probably an animal? Is that kind of what you mean when you say that? Or Yeah, an animal. Yeah, just, a, you know, an animal that we haven't yet... Uh, discovered or you know we have no proof of yet (laughs) we've discovered them just no proof (laughs) yeah no i understand well be careful while you're out there man going to that island you know it didn't really it doesn't sound like it really wanted any sort of altercation with you and you hear a lot of accounts like that i mean i've had many on the show i've talked to many off the air uh, very similar type encounters where it's just outside of the light you can't quite make out uh, facial details you can't quite make you just it looks like you said humanoid and large and they tend to almost like a stalker like stalk you while you're at a campsite they're gonna sit and watch you um yeah almost it's almost like they're they're curious like you know what the hell are you doing over there type thing like wh- what are you doing in my bush type thing you know yeah and 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 i always tell people too your dog will usually any dog will usually let you know when these things are around, they'll react like Buster reacted. I mean, they'll, you take the sweetest dog on the planet and then when these things show up, they'll freeze, they'll growl, they'll snarl and it's out of character for a lot of dogs, but most dogs do react that way. So I know people will get mad when I say, take your dogs, but I would take your dogs cause they'll let you know when they're in the area. Oh yeah. And, and you know, and any dog that, you know, if they're part of your, you know, family group, We'll let you know if there's anything amiss out in the uh, out camping around the um, forest because uh, they're they're going to be protective. They're they're a pack animal, right? So they're going to want to protect their owner. Yeah, I agree with you. Let me know if uh, anything else happens while you're out there, Pat. And I appreciate you coming on and and sharing uh, the different experiences throughout your life. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, I will mention though that uh, I do plan on. Uh, setting up some trail cams up there. Uh, I know I've heard that they tend to not show up on trail cams or something like that, but people use them as a deterrent. Uh, that's what I've, I think I've heard over your show or other shows. Uh, what's your opinion on that, on that? I think that they do avoid them. Why I couldn't tell you, um, and the reason why I think that a lot you'll find on people's property. Um, and I'll tell people, buy the cheapest ones you can. The cheaper, the better. Um, and they tend to back off when you start putting up trail cams. And again, why they do that, I don't know. Because um, we seem to capture everything else on a trail cam for the most part. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and the thing is, too, like I didn't really feel – I don't really feel threatened by it because if it would have wanted to do some, it my two dogs not dead to rights. You know, so I'm not really worried about making it a, as a deterrent. You know, I'm just trying to figure out a way how I can, like, try and capture evidence of it type thing. I got you. I got you. Well, let me know if you get anything with the trail cams. Um, they do. They are captured on trail cams, but it's very rare. It's very, very rare. And a lot of times it's the last second. You'll get a shoulder. You'll get half of a head. You'll get uh, that sort of thing. But I, I really do think that they avoid the trail cams. And again, I can't give you a great answer why they avoid them, but they do. 
Okay, well, thanks for your input there, Wes. Yeah, absolutely, Pat. It was a pleasure talking with you, man. It was a pleasure uh, talking to you, too, and uh, thanks again for letting me come on, and uh, hopefully uh, some other veterans out there that uh, have seen this big black dog will come forward and, uh, you know, share with the rest of us uh, what they may have seen so we can try and maybe deduce what this creature entity, uh, whatever it may be, is. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again, Pat, for coming on. Oh, you're quite welcome, Wes. Have a great weekend.